I'm going to tell you something I'm not supposed to say in a YouTube video. This is not the best way to watch this video. And here's what I mean. The video you're about to watch is from a live session that we had at Tethered Online. There, the people who watched it got live interactive notes. They got to follow along with their Bible. They even had a live chat with other people watching and some of my trained hosts ready to interact with them, pray with them, and give them a lot more resources. Now, we of course welcome you to watch this full video and all of our past videos here on our YouTube channel, but you really will get the best if you visit tethered.online and join us for a live Tethered Online session. But for now, we hope you enjoy this video. The Bible is a book made for a lifetime of study. And today we want to explore the style of the Bible and how it invites us readers into deep thought and meditation. Welcome to Tethered Online. We are so glad that you are here. We are at the conclusion of our current series that is all about the Bible. And it's helping you know what your Bible is, what your Bible isn't, and what you are supposed to do with this thing. If you remember, in our very first session, we answered, what is the Bible? We talked about the Bible not being a book, though we often approach it for the first time that way, but instead, we talked about it being a library of genre and voices that have been collected and bound together. If you missed that discussion, be sure to go find it on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Just look for Tethered. Then in session two, we answered, how do I even read this thing? Like, how do I approach and read the Bible? And it's a good question because how you shouldn't read the Bible is exactly how many of us have adopted. We find a pithy verse or one that would look good on our wall or our skin, and then we directly apply it to our current circumstances. We talked about never reading a Bible verse, but instead, seeing the verse within its entire context. Again, if you missed that video, you can find Tethered on YouTube and watch it all there. Catch yourself up. Today, though, is all about how to use this book. To know that, we have to understand the kind of literature we are reading. So books like Harry Potter or Animal Farm are modern literature. They come from this time period, from this region of the world, but there's also Greek literature like the Odyssey or medieval English literature like Beowulf. These were all written from another time, another place than our own. Each had their own time period, their own culture they were produced in, and they each have their own unique kind of literature. So in order for us to read the Bible well, we need to be aware of the time, the culture, the part of the world that produced it. The Bible has its own form of literature, and it's often by scholars referred to as Jewish meditation literature. So before we take a dive into the power hidden in the mystery of Jewish med meditation literature, I want to show you one of our tidbit videos that will lock in this idea a little more for us. This is a YouTube exclusive content uh, video series that we're doing, so be sure to subscribe to that channel to catch all of our upcoming videos. Welcome to Tether Tidbit, where we help you fall in love with your Bible, your faith, and with Jesus, one tidbit video at a time. The Bible was written for us, but not to us. You see, what I mean by that is the authors of the Bible, they weren't thinking of you when they pinned out their respective books. They were, however, thinking of somebody. So while their words weren't written to a 21st century culture, they were written to a culture, an ancient one, that was drastically different than ours today. So hear me out. The Bible was 100% inspired by God. And we can have confidence that every word, as we have them in our Bible today, is exactly what God wanted them to say. The Bible is for all people at all times and all places to read and gain wisdom from them. So to get the most benefit from what God was communicating when he inspired the authors of the Bible to write, we need to enter their world, to hear the words as the original audience would have heard them and as the author would have in intended for them to mean. Let me show you why this is so important. 
Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a commonly misused verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plan to prosper you, not to harm you, a plan to give you a hope and a future. That's a pretty great sounding verse. You can find it written on NBA player shoes or in framed pictures in people's hallways. Well, that at least sounds good when you apply these verses to you when they weren't actually intended for you. You see, Jeremiah 29, 11, it was not written to us. Those verses were written to the people of Israel to address their situation at that time. The people of Israel were actually in captivity, away from their promised homeland, living in a place called Babylon, their beautiful city of Jerusalem completely destroyed. They had been prisoners hundreds of miles away. And the irony of taking these verses as a promise, even in their original context, is that God is actually disappointing them with these words. He's essentially saying, hey, one day you'll be free, one day you'll prosper, but not today. In fact, it will be 70 more years before it happens. All too often, a nice sounding Bible verse or a strange and cryptic Bible verse is taken out of its context and expected to directly apply to our circumstances. Try this one. The Lord is angry. He will totally destroy them. Their dead bodies will stink. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. Isaiah 34 verses 2 through 3. Out of context, directly applied to my life, yeah, that's frightening. Makes very little sense. So the best tactic we have is to get in the habit of stepping back, looking at the more fundamental question. What was the author originally saying? We cannot simply read our own understanding or even our own desire. And when we look at some of the bizarre sounding parts of the Bible, we have to try to discover who was the original audience. How can I view the text through their lens, not my own? Because if we don't, well, the possibility of confusion, it's endless. If you want more videos just like this, more tidbit videos of learning how to read this book and navigate our faith, you can find more tidbit videos right here on our YouTube channel. You can also find more resources like this, but more in depth and a Christian community in this new hybrid approach at tethered.online. You see, tethered is a hybrid approach to following Jesus. And we can't wait to build community with you. We'll see you all at the next tidbit video. So the Bible is not written to us. It has a unique kind of literature that's different from our own. And it's considered this Jewish meditation literature. Why does all of this matter? Here's why. A key feature of Jewish meditation literature is that it actually lacks a lot of detail that modern readers have come to expect in stories and poems. And this, it often makes the Bible look dated. Sometimes it makes the Bible look simple, but it's actually really sophisticated. And it's created so while the details are limited, the ones that are there, the story that's there, the words that are there, they actually really matter. Let me give you an example. I'll use... Uh, an excerpt from uh, a Harry Potter series. Here's what it says. It was lit by thousands and thousands of candles that were floating in midair over four long tables where the rest of the students were sitting. These tables were laid with glittering golden plates and goblets. At the top of the hall was another long table where the teachers were sitting. The hundreds of faces staring at them looked like pale lanterns in the flickering candlelight. Harry looked upward and saw a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. It was hard to believe there was a ceiling there at all, and that the Great Hall didn't simply open on to the heavens. Again, that's J.K. Rowling's words from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Now compare that reading, that read-over paragraph in the Harry Potter collection, one that you probably don't know was even in there until you reread it, Compare that short excerpt to one of the most profound moments in the Bible, which says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, 
But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So what does this Garden of Eden really look like? Why create this tree that Adam couldn't eat from? What is going to actually give Adam and Eve this knowledge of good and evil? And death? Why is death a part of this? Not to mention the coming chapter that involves a talking snake. I mean, so many puzzles in this story. So many ambiguities. And some of these questions that we raise while reading these stories, they don't matter to the author like they do us. But other ambiguities are 100% intentional. And here's what I mean. The simplicity, the ambiguities, the puzzles of the Bible are not an invitation for us to impose our own cultural assumptions onto it. But they're actually really invitations into adventure of reading and discovery. Psalm 1, it describes the ideal Bible reader as somebody who meditates upon Scripture day and night. In Hebrew, actually, the word for meditate, it's the word hagah, it means to mutter or to speak quietly. And this holds the idea of slowly, quietly reading the Bible aloud to yourself and talking about it with like-minded people. Here's that verse in entirety, Psalm 1, starting in 1 through 6. Blessed is the one who does not stand and step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but who delights in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, it prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like shaft that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So the tree in the Garden of Eden, it serves as a test, a choice that God gives all humans. And trees are oh so important to God's imagery of life and prosperity. In fact, In our Psalm 1 reading that we just read, perhaps you picked up on that tree language. Planted by a stream producing, you got it, fruit. The Bible, it's dense. It's loaded with ambiguities, but all of them make sense when you bring them together. And if all of this seems like too much, don't worry yourself. You were not meant to pick up on all of this in your first reading of the Bible, which is why Psalm 1 talks about reading it day and night, over and over again for an entire lifetime. The style of writing, it forces us to slow down, to read carefully, and to embark on a journey of discovery, not a journey of conquering. You use the Bible as water to parched lips or bread to a growling stomach. It's not a one-hit wonder, but a sustainer of life. Like breathing, we intake the puzzling stories of the Bible in small portions as often as we can, allowing them to energize our mind, our heart, and our soul. And as we do this, something remarkable actually happens. You see, while we begin with reading the Bible, we're going to come out of the experience with the Bible having read us. Its stories become my stories. Why do you think the Bible invites us to engage with its story rather than provide all of the answers that we're seeking up front?
What does it mean that the Bible reads you? What does that look like practically in your life? Don't forget that we have our free tethered action packs where you can take all of this information and put it into action starting today. This is what so many people love about tethered. It's not just about watching videos and knowing more at the end of those videos, but we want to equip you with resources and tools so that you can start putting into action all of this right now. One thing you're going to find in that action pack is a crossword puzzle with all of these notes and really cool thing, you can um, send us a message and some information and we will send a Bible to anybody um, that, you, that you request. So we'll just send them a Bible for free. So that's just a couple of things that you can get in that action pack. Um, just follow the links all around you in the description, wherever you're watching this and uh, you'll get access to that. If you want to find out more about Tethered, if you want to get access to more resources like other action packs, or if you want to get in touch with the Tethered team, just be sure to visit our website, tethered.online. Tethered is a hybrid approach to following Jesus. We'll see you all for the next series. I hope you enjoyed that video. Remember, you can find live versions of videos just like that one by visiting tethered.online. But if you want to stay here on YouTube, we're good with that too. Be sure to continue watching some of our other videos that we have going on. Hit the subscribe button, like this video, share it, all the things the kids are saying. And remember, Tethered is a hybrid approach to following Jesus. We'll see you guys later.